Today on Aqua Kids, we're back with the students from the Marine Academy of Science and Technology. Join us as we head out to Sandy Hook Bay in New Jersey to monitor fish populations using sonar and trawling. Aqua Kids, Aqua Kids, doing what we have to do, saving our earth, land, air, and sea. All we gotta do is keep it green and green. Hi, I'm Hannah Jones. Welcome to Aqua Kids from Sandy Hook, New Jersey. Let's go get the kids and find out what we're doing today. Hey, Selena, this is a really beautiful place. Yeah, it's fabulous. I wonder what we're doing today. Hey, guys. Hey. hey, Hannah. So what are we doing? We'll be boarding the RV Blue Sea, where we'll be trawling, tagging, and scanning. What does that mean? Well, we're going to catch, sort, measure, and then release various species. It helps the scientists better protect these creatures. What do you think we'll see? Uh, skates, maybe some flounder, and maybe even some small sharks. Ooh. How's everybody doing today? Doing well. Uh, we're going to start off today by towing a side scan sonar, which is laying here on deck. And what that will tell us is what's on top of the bottom, where you normally use a depth sounder, which looks straight down. What this does, it looks out to either side. Oh. So it's bouncing sound waves out and back. And if it sees something, it will create a shadow of it. And how far does it extend? Uh, it depends on the frequency, but they can extend several, almost a thousand feet oh to either goodness. side. The unit we're using today is looking at 100 feet to either side, but it gives us very high resolution so you get really good detail. What are we looking for exactly? Uh, today what we're going to do is, before we trawl the net across the bottom to catch fish, we're going to look to see whether there's any obstructions that the net might hit. But we could also look for, for shipwrecks, um, lost objects, you know, sand features. So what would a typical obstruction be? It could really be anything. It could be an old anchor, it could be a pile of rocks, uh, it could be a piece of a wreck that we didn't know what was here. Sometimes you just don't know. Interesting, and then obviously living creatures as well. Yeah, you'll see, you could see fish up in the water column, um, you could see whales or dolphins oh. if they swim within the beam length Very and stuff. Cool. So. Now it's time for Aqua Quiz with your host, Drew Cruz. I'm your host, Drew Cruz. And now it's time to test your knowledge with Aqua Quiz. Sandy Hook Bay is part of the Gateway National Recreation Area. The Bay Area is home to hundreds of species. Do you know what marine mammal makes Sandy Hook their winter home? Is it A, sea lions, B, otters, C, dolphins, or D, seals? I'll have the answer after the break. Do you know what marine mammal spends its winters on Sandy Hook Skeleton Island? The answer is D, seals. Sandy Hook seal visitors are harbor seals. They can be found sunning on the beach from December through March. I'll have another aqua quiz next week. Hey guys, I think we need a new mic. This one's not working. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. Come on, this is Liza Baskin and she's gonna teach us about otter trawling. Hey. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Welcome aboard the Blue Sea. We're gonna be doing an otter trawl today for you guys so we can catch some organism and see what's out there in the bay. All right, you got it? Let it come to you. Good job, it's going fast, be ready. Got the doors? Ready? Eyes back here. There's 200 meters of your uh, net to come in, so it's gonna be a little while to get up on deck. We tow 200 meters out because that's the national standard for a ground fish survey. Um, that's so we can compare our data to other people's data across the country. The data that we collect today, we actually report to the DEP, uh, New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. They use that data to determine what sizes of fish can be caught. Like all these fishermen out here are after flatfish, um, in particular summer flounder. And so they use the sizes that we catch to make determinations about what regulations so people can decide what type of fish you can catch but still not damage the species. Flatfish? Oh, that's a flounder. <laughs> 
I heard you mention about the flounders. We actually have two major types of flounders here in New Jersey. Uh, most people call them summer flounder and winter flounder because when they're in the bay. But if you're really from New Jersey, you call a summer flounder a fluke. And it's neat, what we'll show you when you pick them up. The fluke have their uh, mouths on the left side and the summer flounder, uh, the winter flounder have them on the right side. So you'll be able to tell which is which. Flutes or fluke? Fluke, like the flippers of a whale. Oh. So when this gets up on deck, things get pretty chaotic because we want to get the fish measured and tagged if we're going to tag them, identify the species, and all of that is stressful for them because they're out of the water. So by that time, we're going to have to work really quickly so we can save them. Save the fishies! All right, Avery's coming up. Ready? Keep it coming, Jeff. Good, drop it right there. You, come here. We need somebody with muscles. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wow. What can we do? OK, as soon as this toast comes back here, you guys are actually going to pick up the fish and bring them up to Maddie. Maddie. Wave at us. Look, guys, this, this is one of the fish that we caught. We caught several of these species. Locally, this is known as a porgy. A porgy? Uh, yeah, a very common fish here, especially in the estuary, right the bay where we are. Um, recreationally important species, so many people fish for them. Um, but they're a little small, so we're not going to tag them today. Uh, but we are going to tag this species here, this larger fish. And what? Well, So this fish is known as a winter flounder. And actually, these guys live here in Raritan Bay um, in the winter, and they spawn in the rivers around St. Patrick's Day in March. This time of year, they're heading to their summer grounds. They'll go out to the edge of the continental shelf, about 300 feet of water, and they'll come back in October. So if you notice, the, the eyes on this flounder are on the right side of the fish. So that's one of the ways I know this is a winter flounder and not a summer flounder. Uh, so that, let me show you. they swim sideways? Yes, these, these, these fish, they lay flat on the bottom and they swim sideways. And here's another winter flounder, a little guy. These guys mostly, um, they eat shrimp and they actually eat clam siphons as well. So okay. clams that are buried in the water, they'll grab the, the siphon and actually spin like a crocodile and snap the siphon off and Oh, yeah. they're but so these guys are headed offshore. They're, they're about a week or so. They'll be 80 miles east of here, 300 feet of water. This is really great. What else do we have? Look at uh, that. We oh. have corgis. We caught a lot of mussels. What's that? This is spider crab. Very common here in the bay. Um, and they get much larger than this. This is a little one. <laughs> That's a little one. They can be very large. Here's a neat juvenile fish. Oh, that's a crab. This is, this is a, a rock crab or a Jonah crab. Oh. Ow. <laughs> <laughs> and here's a neat fish. This is what we call a juvenile fish. This is called a butterfish. Oh. And it'll get a little bit bigger about that. And we caught him here in the estuary. As adults, they'll be out in the, in the open ocean. Is that a shark egg pack? Not technically, but it's it's actually the egg sac of a skate. And what did you call it? A mermaid purse. The correct you are. This is a mermaid's purse. And this is actually the egg sac of the clear nose skate, which is technically a member of the shark family, shark skates and rays, cartilaginous fishes. So this is a northern moon snail. This animal is actually a predator. Did you guys ever see a, 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 a clamshell on the beach that has a hole in it, a really yeah. circular hole? These guys are predators of clams. Oh, that and little thing? Yeah, this little thing. Because snails have a have a, a sharp tongue called a radula. And they'll get on top of a clam and they'll just keep drilling their tongue in a circle until they drill a hole right through the clam. Uh, so and they'll eat the clam out right out from inside his shell. Now here's also a moon snail. What's in here in this shell? A hermit crab. Nice, yes. There's one coming out of his shell right now. And now these are two different moon snails. So we have the northern moon snail, and this is a lobed moon snail. Do you see that right there? Yeah. So they're actually two different species of, of moon snail that we have locally here in New Jersey. Guys, I think we should go tag some of the winter flounder that we got. And who knows, we might hear back from them next week, 
two years, five years from now. Let's go do so that. let's go do some science. Awesome. More fun with the Apple Kids when we come back. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. Before we get back to the kids on the boat, I'm here with Liza Baskin from MAST. Tell us a little bit about your school. Um, well, MAST is a four-year public high school, really the Marine Academy of Science and Technology. Uh, we take kids from all over the state of New Jersey who are passionate about marine science, kind of like the Aqua Kids. They come here to learn about marine research, marine technology, and we kind of do all these things you saw on the boat today. Great. So what are we doing now? Well, first we're going to get a length on this fish, on this winter flounder, and then we're going to fix this tag to it, and we're going to release it as quickly as possible. So I'm going to quickly put the tag in the fish. Ooh, does that hurt? Well, oh. when, when you got your ears pierced, did it hurt? Okay, a little, but not too much. A little, but so here's, now this winter flounder's tag, 17 inches, and we are going to release this, and this guy's going to swim offshore, and maybe we'll hear back from him a year from now. So you want to release this fish? Sure, just toss it overboard. Yeah, right overboard. All right. Back into the sea. Bye, little buddy. See you later. <laughs> Good job. Wow, look at the size of this starfish. You know what these guys eat? No. Clams. They love to eat clams. A starfish has these tube feet, and they can lock onto a clam. Um, and because it's not like our muscles, which, you know, they get tired if we lock on, this dot right here, see that orange dot? That's called the madreporite, and that's like the water valve system. So it can take in water through this madreporite and lock these two feet. And a clam has to open up. It's going to breathe sooner or later. <laughs> and when it does, the starfish, so he's also a predator, just like the moon snail. So what are we doing now? So now we're going to measure the rest of the fish that are in here and identify them. So this is a scup, and they're in the drum family and they get to be about eight inches long. Now, since we have a lot of them, we're going to measure 10 and then just count the rest. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna measure him from the tip of his nose to the tip of his tail. Mm -hmm. So that's about 13 inches, 13 centimeters rather. He's uh, got 13 centimeters. How big are they normally? Well, the biggest they can get to be is about eight inches, but this is typically the size we see here. So, about five inches, six inches. Why do you guys wear gloves? Well, we wear gloves because, first off, it protects the fish. It doesn't deplete their slime coating. And second off, it protects us if we're handling any kind of fish, like if we catch a dog shark or anything that could bite us. So how often do you guys do this? Uh, we trawl approximately once to twice a week, depending on the different classes. So you get a lot of data through the season. Mm -hmm. So why is it important that we do this? What, how does this relate to us? Well, although this is not global, this little window in the bay is going to give us a, sort of a bigger picture that stuff that goes on the bay could be applicable to a larger scale. Mm -hmm. So if we study our fish ecology, we can get an idea of fish ecology at a global scale. That makes sense. This is so cool. These students get to be out here on a boat instead of in a classroom at school. So Maddie, how did you get to do this? Well, the reason I get to be out here enjoying this beautiful day instead of being in class mm -hmm. is because I go to MAST. And MAST is a marine science-based school. Okay. And I'm also enrolled in oceanography. So this is actually a part of the curriculum to be out here on this boat doing the fish stock assessments. That's so awesome. Yeah, it's really fun. <laughs> I'm jealous. They get to be out here all day. Evelyn, how did you even choose this place? Uh, well, I used to live on Sandy Hook, so the school's actually down the street from where I used to live. And ever since I was really young, I wanted to be a marine biologist. I used to go in tidal pools all the time. So when I heard about this school that was a marine biology school and they go out on the boat all the time, I just knew it was the perfect school for me. Oh, that's so fun. So, Jeff, you're from the A... what is well, it? ALS, but it's the American Literal Society. Mm -hmm. And we're a coastal conservation organization based here right in Sandy Hook. Mm -hmm. um, my main job is I run our marine fish tagging program, as you saw before, but we also do many other things. We do habitat restoration, we work with oyster reefs mm -hmm. and horseshoe crabs. Um, we do advocacy for access for the public to the beach, so everyone yeah. can go to the beach. Real important stuff. And I, I feel that our work is very important and we're protecting the marine environment, mm -hmm. protecting it so that my children and your children will always have a healthy ocean. It certainly does help the community. Thanks. Well, I heard the Aqua Kids were coming to Sandy Hook to work with the students at MAST to learn about marine science and the important work that 
organizations like Marine Academy of Science and Technology and the American Literal Society does. I was so excited and it has been a great day. We had a great trawl. We're towing right now. We're going to pull the net back one more time, possibly tag some more fish. And thank you, Aqua Kids, for teaching marine science to kids all across America. Oh, hi. I'm so glad you're here. You know, it always excites me to meet young people who love to protect the earth as much as I do. Young people who are pioneering powerful ways to conserve and protect our planet for all of us. I call them Eco Defenders. Let's find out what they're up to. Hi, this is Selena with Eco Defenders. On today's show, we're speaking with Cedar Anderson, who is one of the creators of the Flow Hive. Hi, Cedar. Thanks for having me on your show. Of course. So, what is the Flow Hive and why was it created? The Flow Hive is an invention that my father and myself came up with. It's basically a normal beehive and then we put our flow frame invention into the hive. And what that allows us to do is harvest the honey directly from the hive. So the honey flows straight out of the hive and into your jar, ready to eat, ready to go on your table. So does it disturb the bees? So we've designed it all the way to be as least disturbing to the bees as possible. So what we give the bees is a partially made comb. The bees then cover that all in wax. They draw their own wax out from the flow comb and then seal the honey in with their wax capping just as they normally do with any other honeycomb. Now, what that means is when we harvest the honey, the honey flows directly out of the flow frame, this end here, while the bees are standing on their wax capping and they actually hardly even notice. You can be right at the back of the hive watching the honey flow out and watching the bees walk around on the surface of the comb doing business as usual. <laughs> the old way of harvesting was a long labour intensive labour of love and I did it for years and years. I used to sell honey to the local shops and it was hard work. It was really hard work. What are your goals for the Flow Hive? We started off with a dream of creating a community of beekeepers all around the globe and really increasing the popularity of beekeeping. And we're happy to say that happened way faster than we expected. We're getting pictures every day of people having fun with the beehives and harvesting honey and learning lots about bees. So we want to keep going on that path and keep educating and keep learning with the whole bee community. Why are bees important to the environment? So bees are really important to the environment and us as humans. There's so much of our food that is pollinated by bees. Without the bees, we are in real trouble. We do have a food supply issue if we have no bees. And it's not only our cropping food, it's also the whole ecosystem that relies on pollination. What message would you like to leave with our youth viewers? Becoming a beekeeper is more about the whole ecosystem and the environment around us. It's not just about bees, it's not just about the honey. It's, it's about learning to, to interact and connect with the natural world around us. And I think becoming a beekeeper, it's just a fantastic way to it's just a fantastic way to really take a look at what's happening around you and, and connect to the natural world around us. This is Cedar Anderson, one of the creators of the Flow Hive. You're watching Aqua Kids. Cool. Wasn't that amazing? Okay, now it's your turn. If you or someone you know is doing something remarkable to help our planet, let us know about it and you could be our next Eco Defender. I gotta go. Wanna keep up with our adventures? Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Jalen, and this is Earth Edition. Long ago, fishermen believed that the supply of creatures in the ocean was limitless. For hundreds of years, our oceans and waterways were overfished. Through the Industrial Revolution, the effects of pollution were not known. This is why now, preservation efforts and research are more important than ever. 
Marine biology, the study of marine life, looks at the entire ecosystem, from the largest whales to the microorganisms. Marine biology requires a collection of specimens to study, so fishing methods such as traps and nets were adapted for scientific learning. As technology created more sophisticated methods of research, our knowledge and understanding has also evolved. Tagging and re-releasing fish, or marine mammals, allows biologists to track the development of their life cycles. Scuba equipment gives scientists an opportunity to observe, collect, and document living things underwater. Remotely operated vehicles, or ROVs, are used for observations that are too deep for divers. Sonar, which stands for sound navigation and ranging, uses sound waves to see the ocean floor, explore shipwrecks, and detect marine life. Therefore, along with our progress in technology, so comes the progress with conservation. I'm Jalen, and this is Earth Edition. Today was a good day. Okay, so that was really fun. Yeah, it was. So, what did we learn today? I learned today that it's important to scan and tag fish. Who knew? And I learned that trawling is netting and that there's so many different species out here in the Sandy Hook area. Fantastic. A special thanks to Captain Jay Andrews. Remember, it's up to you to keep it green and blue. Protect our planet. We'll see you next time on Aqua Kids. Bye! Bye. Gotta do is keep it green and blue